Yes, I was about to introduce Shane Fitzsimmons, AFSM. He joins us today in his new, newish now, it's been uh, about a year, role as Commissioner of Resilience, New South Wales. Shane was appointed as the inaugural Commissioner in this role and Deputy Secretary Emergency Management with the Department of Premier and Cabinet in May last year. He is currently the Chair of the State Emergency Management Committee, the State Recovery Committee and the National Emergency Medal Committee. This appointment followed his distinguished career with the New South Wales RFS of over 35 years, including as a volunteer. Now, from my perspective as a member of the public, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this thought, as the 19 and 20 fires raged throughout the state. It was this seemingly unprepossessing man who emerged as if from the smoke to guide us as the community through. For uh, members of the frightened and despairing public, Shane became the face and the voice of reason and the person that we could trust to get our information from. Together with you, our many amazing volunteers, it was Shane's uh, honesty that became a reassuring thing for the community of New South Wales and Australia to hold on to in the sheer scale of the unfolding disaster. Uh, from a personal perspective, in uh, would have been around June, maybe July last year, uh, in my daughter's school in Sydney after they had returned to school after lockdown, uh, the kids were asked to do an assignment on a real life hero. And I can say that in their class of about 25 or 30, uh, at least three, maybe four kids chose Shane Fitzsimmons as their real life hero. He was amongst names like uh, Nelson Mandela, Greta Thunberg, and uh, Iron Man. Uh, there were quite a few. <laughs> so, so you're in very good company, <laughs> very good company. From 2007 to 2020, he was the commissioner of the RFS, as well as holding another of uh, a number of other related roles. Uh, Shane has been awarded the RFS Long Service Medal for his more than 30 years, the National Medal in recognition of the more than 35 years and the Australian Fire Service Medal. And amongst his many other awards last year, he was awarded the Father of the Year. One thing I have managed to find out about Shane, and I'm pretty confident that you don't know this, I've shared things with you about people that you know, but things about them that you didn't know. I can tell you that at primary school, Shane Fitzsimmons was a ballet dancer for a year with the, with the Terry Hills Junior Ballet School, and he was pretty damn good from all reports. So there you go. Yeah, that's, that's what you're getting the round of applause for. <laughs> All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm genuinely delighted, as I know you would be too, to have Shane here to talk to us and to answer your questions as well. Could you please put your hands together and welcome the New South Wales Commissioner of Resilience, Shane Fitzsimmons. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you, uh, everybody, for that uh, wonderful reception and welcome. And um, the thought of this little bald fat guy in a uh, tight outfit dancing around a stage is probably something uh, we all need to get out of our mind really quickly. Um, he did ask me the question, I, I've been, I need to introduce guests and, and talk about something uh, that the group don't know. And I said, well, we're pretty buggered in this group because there's not much of my life that people don't know about. Um, so, but we had to think of something. So this afternoon, um, and I know I'm the really the only thing between you and a safe passage home, so I'll be very focused as much as we can, uh, but importantly uh, is opening up, uh, reflecting on the last 12 months uh, and what it means, uh, the new organisation and the role uh, of Resilience New South Wales, but then importantly uh, opening up to open discussion, uh, questions and comments uh, that any of you might have uh, to, close out, to close out the session. So it was just over 12 months ago, the 1st of May uh, of 2020, that the organisation Resilience New South Wales was brought into effect. It was brought into effect as an executive agency within the Department of Premier and Cabinet, <clears throat> an executive agency uh, that had a responsibility uh, to provide coordination and collaboration across government, uh, down through government to, to local government, uh, and of course, linking in with industry, business, not-for-profits, non-government organisations, as well uh, as connecting up to the Commonwealth uh, to lead the state's efforts uh, when it comes to disaster preparedness uh, right through to 
through disaster recovery. And the organisation um, has spent a deal of time seeking to understand uh, what resilience means in an organisation uh, that's been newly created. But if I just wind back a little bit and seek to understand why uh, we were first brought about, uh, and it directly correlates uh, with the unprecedented bushfire season of 2019 and 20. Uh, never before has the state seen or experienced uh, a fire season of that scale and that magnitude. And it was unprecedented on so many levels. Uh, the scale and longevity, uh, the intensity, the fire behaviour, uh, with many occasions fire behaviour exceeding um, uh, the best predictive services available, uh, manual and, and, and simulated. Uh, we saw a damage and a destruction toll uh, in this state like we've never seen before. Just under 2,500 homes destroyed, 5.5 million hectares. And of course, uh, the tragedy uh, that was 26 lives that were lost, including seven of our own firefighters. Our four volunteers, Jeff and Andrew, Sam and Cole, and our three air crew, uh, Ian, Paul and, and Rick, who all died uh, during those, those awful times. You won't find me using the phrase black summer bushfires. <clears throat> I think it does a significant disservice to all those communities in New South Wales and further afield that were so terribly impacted uh, by the 1920 fire season, remembering that we were already averaging a thousand fires during, uh, during winter, uh, June, July, August, a thousand fires a month uh, or more. And then it simply intensified as we moved into spring uh, and then into summer. So on the back of our worst ever bushfire season, with a damage and destruction toll like we've never seen before, the government knew that they had to do something substantial, something more meaningful uh, with the recovery effort. So whilst the fires went for weeks and months, indeed they went for about 160 days um, of high intensity operations, uh, 200 days of consecutive section 44 bushfire emergencies. So when we've got five or six months uh, of intense fire activity, uh, with a damage uh, impact um, effect that went from the Queensland border to our Victorian border along the Great Dividing Range, we knew that the recovery, the recovery program, the recovery effort, the recovery work was not just going to take five to six months, it was going to go for many months, it was going to go for many years, and indeed it continues in earnest to this day. So the government knew that it needed to embrace a recovery coordination effort like we've never had before. And whilst the, whilst the firefighting effort was, was unprecedented, so too has the commitment to rebuilding and recovering. And the budget alone that we're administering and dispersing across New South Wales is in the order of $4.4 billion uh, worth of investment uh, into the state's bushfire recovery efforts alone. Uh, we've got $3 billion uh, from, the, from the state government, another $1.4 billion uh, with match funding coming in from the Commonwealth. We've seen more than 20,000 businesses uh, benefiting and being supported through, through grants. We've seen just under 2,000 farmers similarly assisted primary industry grants, um, hundreds of millions of dollars paid out there. We saw one of the biggest cleanup efforts ever undertaken in the state with over 3,600 properties uh, cleaned up, 3,600 homes and, and businesses that were cleaned up at no cost to the owners. Um, and a contract that resulted in, in securing um, 120 different cleanup crews uh, coordinated under a, a large organisation, Lang O'Rourke, um, 120 cleanup, crew, cleanup crews, uh, 250 different locations around the state. More than 1,000 local jobs were created uh, to help with that cleanup and, and uh, tidy up work, uh, with 99% of all of that work going to regional uh, businesses and operators. The only area where we had to bring in uh, out of area, i.e. Sydney or elsewhere into some of these local regions, but with some of the particularly complicated asbestos uh, management work, which was, which was limited in, in availability in terms of, in terms of um, the resources and personnel and expertise. More than 8,000 people uh, were provided with emergency accommodation We've seen more than 200 recovery pods converting shipping containers that have been distributed so people can live on their property uh, and oversee uh, the coordination and rebuilding of their home. 
that was a partnership we did with the Mindaroo Foundation, the Salvation Army and the Red Cross. Uh, we've seen uh, the Bushfire Customer Care Line, uh, 11,000 people that we've been maintaining contact with uh, as a result of the, of the bushfires and the displacement and the needs of support that, that people are seeking for. Recovery support services in their, in their different forms uh, have been uh, uh, continuing to deal with 1,800 families, um, tailoring case management and support uh, where needed. We've seen dedicated personnel uh, being sponsored and employed into the most impacted local government areas, 23 local government areas, to help them uh, with that local recovery uh, and support programs. We're continuing to see rolled out a significant uh, number of of grants and support programs uh, focused on long-term uh, local economic recovery efforts, uh, but also uh, local bushfire community, uh, community grants. So the initiation of the organisation being stood up was really centred around uh, what has been and continues to be our largest ever uh, recovery operation effort uh, that the state's experienced. And we've seen that coordination tying in uh, every, every branch and every sector <clears throat> of the state government. We've seen connections and partnerships with our Commonwealth partners in the National uh, Bushfire Recovery Authority, <clears throat> which has now morphed into something else. We've seen considerable partnerships uh, with not-for-profit uh, and business sector, but local chambers of business, local communities, and importantly, uh, local councils. You might remember when the, when the weather finally broke and the bushfires uh, were settled, uh, that was in February of 2020. And those fires broke all right. They broke with some of the most significant rainfall um, that we'd experienced in a long time. Uh, and, and, and that rainfall resulted in considerable widespread storms, damage, flood, damage, and across a very denuded landscape uh, from fire and from drought, uh, we saw significant landslides, erosion, um, really impacting and compounding the effects of those that had just been through uh, one of the worst drought periods in centuries, uh, and then on top of that, uh, one of the worst, one of the worst uh, bushfires or the worst bushfire season uh, ever supported. That was in February of 2020, uh, and the rain was so considerable we saw places like Warragamba Dam go from somewhere around 40 odd percent uh, up to around 80 odd percent uh, in a matter of uh, a week or so with. Uh, with good rain and dams right across the state benefited from uh, significant inflows. But as we came out of the February period of considerable rain, uh, we were then straight into uh, COVID uh, and all the implications and challenges that came with responding to, managing through, dealing with the extraordinary implications of COVID. Uh, and through that, through that effort, uh, we've, we've been represented, uh, myself as part of the, the Premier's State Crisis Policy Committee, uh, where, we, where we look at the implications and the decisions and the strategies going forward in relation to COVID. Uh, we've seen um, our team members um, uh, providing the resourcing and the support, uh, sustaining that effort for the State Emergency Operations Centre, providing the personnel and the resources to support the CECON, the State Emergency Operations Controller, which is the Deputy Commissioner for Police, Deputy Commissioner Gary Warboys. We've also seen a considerable impact, a compounding impact, into communities through COVID, uh, where there was a significant call uh, on support and assistance in the home and on the property. And whether that was through the basic provision of things like food hampers and, and other supplies into hotel quarantine, uh, where we're supporting people uh, with basic care and sanitary and, uh, and wellbeing products. So a considerable uh, impact uh, into, into some of those organisations, uh, some of those um, uh, people people affected, and then organisations that would routinely be there providing considerable support, organisations like Food Bank, uh, Food Bank who rely enormously on volunteers uh, and, and corporate partnerships where they're allowing their employees to volunteer during the week. Through COVID, uh, the restrictions and the, and the limitations of people volunteering and connecting with organisations like Food Bank meant their capacity to produce and, and deliver uh, hampers uh, meant that we had to provide resources and, and other alternatives and options. And, and I can say, um, pleasingly, that we were able to access uh, our partnerships with organisations like the RFS and like, like the SES and others uh, that could assist not only with uh, the occasional packing, uh, but importantly, the distribution and delivery uh, of, 
of hampers and other goods and materials to people that find themselves quite displaced and, and affected. So we then live right through the last 12 months uh, of COVID. <clears throat> and uh, of course, we get to March of this year and we see another significant uh, rainfall event, a significant rainfall event uh, on the back of uh, pretty, pretty saturated and full catchments and dam areas. And that rainfall event through March uh, resulted in a significant um, uh, amount of uh, flooding uh, and damage, uh, most notably uh, through the Hawkesbury Nepean catchment area uh, and the um, mid north coast, north coast areas where, where anything from one in, a, one in a 10 to one in 20 year flood event in the Hawkesbury Nepean uh, to up the, up the north coast, uh, one in 200 uh, year events with some of the, some of the inflows and the river rises uh, and the inundation and effect. 63 local government areas were declared natural disasters uh, as a result of those floods uh, and the work continues uh, to this day. Of those 63 local government areas that were declared natural disasters for the floods, 60% of those local government areas were also natural disaster declared areas from the bushfires. So you've got the drought, the bushfires, COVID and now floods impacting and compounding the impact and dislocation and, and disaffection on communities uh, pretty far and wide across New South Wales. <clears throat> but for those floods alone, we initiated and administered 33 evacuation centres where just under 3,000 people um, uh, were, were coordinated and supported. Uh, the SES dealt with just under 15,000 calls for assistance. Uh, the impact assessment showed that there was um, 4,500 damaged or destroyed homes uh, with 1,300 of those homes uninhabitable. Uh, the insurance bill alone is, is uh, sorry, 42,500 insurance claims uh, with $600 million worth of, of insured damage. Uh, but unlike the bushfires, where the vast majority of people impacted and displaced and losing, losing property were insured, uh, when it comes to the flood areas, uh, the vast majority of people um, uh, impacted and affected are not, are not insured. And of the homes that were actually destroyed, 50%, uh, where you would describe as portable, uh, portable homes uh, with a great concentration, typically uh, assigned uh, to residencies or others in caravan parks. Some very low lying areas, particularly up through the north coast, uh, around through the Hawkesbury Nepean, uh, a considerable displacement uh, of some of our most disadvantaged uh, and challenged uh, community members uh, across New South Wales. Uh, and for some people, um, um, uh, the challenge, particularly on the North Coast, to find emergency accommodation is proving enormously challenging. Uh, there's, a, there's an extraordinary limitation uh, on available housing uh, in the short, medium uh, and longer term. So the, the challenges continue to be compounded. Already there's over $500 million worth of supports that have gone out for the, for the flood recovery efforts and we've just progressed uh, phase three of funding uh, between the Commonwealth and the state. And I was in meetings with the uh, with the uh, New South Wales Cabinet uh, Expenditure Review Committee uh, only last week, and I'm hoping to see some positive uh, announcements and outcomes about the uh, increase in support that's going to be going on uh, in the next little while to support those flood affected and flood impacted areas. What I would also like to highlight in relation to the flood response effort uh, was um, the new approach we took to early intervention with relief and recovery, particularly with the washout and cleanup. Uh, and I extend my sincere appreciation uh, to all of you here and all of those uh, you represent, uh, because our ability to partner with the RFS, Fire and Rescue, uh, and of course our ADF, uh, meant that we had literally uh, thousands and thousands of people in the field uh, joining uh, with communities, walking back into their homes, walking back into their businesses as the waters were receding, as the mud and the sludge and the shit and everything is through the properties, um, before it all dries out, before it all goes hard, uh, lending a hand, um, and there's nothing better uh, than a whole heap of fire trucks that carry many thousands of litres of water that are independent of water supply, that are independent of the need for power. And I don't know about you, uh, but it's frightening when I reflect on flood events in yesteryear, when you see people coupling up together, long extension leads, trying to all borrow power for each other, connecting ultimately up with a gurney or something across flooded waterways, um, the, the possibility uh, of something going wrong uh, is, is extremely apparent. 
but with the independence uh, of the water supply and the and the ability to deliver that water uh, in a very meaningful way with a workforce that was so willing to assist those uh, with bulking out waste, uh, getting the removal out of homes, getting the removal out of businesses, whether it was soiled waste, whether it was whether it was uh, soft coverings and furniture and and gyp rock off walls or, or carpet and flooring off off one's homes, it didn't matter what it was, uh, but the ability to bulk that out uh, was quite remarkable. To this day, we have not seen any negative comment, any adverse reaction from the community uh, other than praise for helping them uh, in, in their most vulnerable of times. And in my meetings of, of, of recent uh, with, with councils and local recovery committees uh, up and down the coast and in the, in the Hawkesbury Nepean, um, compared to previous flood events, that one different approach to intervention and assistance to get the relief and the recovery arrangements underway as the response if it was occurring has brought them four to six weeks, um, uh, depending on where they are uh, in terms of that time frame. And that four to six weeks might not seem like much to, to many, but if you're walking back in uh, and you've just got no idea to contemplate how on earth you're gonna go forward uh, from that point, um, what people were achieving uh, as, as a lot of the shop owners and homeowners that I visited during the flood said, what we were able to achieve in a matter of hours or days with these teams we were contemplating would take us days or many weeks. We also partnered with our Environment Authority and our Public Works, and across those impacted areas, we distributed over 2,000 large skip bins, uh, and the, uh, the bulk out of waste uh, is in many millions and millions of tonnes of waste. Uh, and what we also signalled was, with the people uh, affected, was as you're bulking out the waste, can you help us with sorting of that waste uh, into things like steel, steel items, white goods, uh, soft furnishes, building materials, gyp rock, uh, soiled waste, et cetera, et cetera. And people in the main did it. Uh, and the extraordinary effort meant uh, that so much of the waste was recycled because the challenge we've got is uh, during the bushfires, it was one thing to bulk out a lot of waste and get it into landfill sites. But this time around with the floods, most of those landfill sites that we were calling on were now dams. There was nowhere to put it. So we had to have temporary uh, bulk storage uh, locations, et cetera, et cetera. So we move through the floods, uh, and of course, uh, we've got the extraordinary uh, impacts occurring now across the state and have been for probably six or eight months, depending on where you are, uh, with the mouse plague. Uh, and, we're, and we're connecting and, and working closely with uh, our colleagues in DPI uh, around what the options and the programs are uh, going forward around subsidies and activities and actions uh, to, to, to seek to uh, mitigate the impact, uh, but also um, uh, try to bring them under control. As most farmers keep saying, uh, based, on, based on their own historical experience, uh, they're really relying on the cold snap and some frost to, to kick in and slow them down. Um, and even some of them not losing their sense of humour also signal to me that once that happens, uh, they're really good to get the ploughs back out and they've got their very own blood and bone fertiliser churning through the paddocks. So um, they, 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 they are, it's a very serious issue. It's a very debilitating uh, issue across so many uh, geographic areas and on the back of uh, what has been uh, identified as, as a bumper season for agriculture and cropping uh, and the like over 2020 uh, to have so much uh, feed and other property being damaged uh, and affected is is extremely debilitating. But again, it's just another uh, disaster uh, on top of uh, so many other that are quite apparent. Uh, the other things that we've inherited uh, and we continue to work on, uh, which is not so public, but has been released in some different areas, is that uh, I never, I never um, was aware of so much around cyber security, uh, cyber activity, cyber crime, uh, breaches, attacks, ransom, uh, and you will have seen in the media um, uh, 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 what's been reported as a fairly exponential growth uh, in cyber activity and cyber crime, uh, targeting individuals, businesses uh, and governments at all levels. Uh, and there's been some pretty uh, significant uh, cases publicised around breaches and attacks and access to, to private information across New South Wales. We've also, we've also taken on responsibility uh, for uh, the oversight, coordination and management of the state's critical infrastructure. Uh, for the last uh, couple of decades, uh, critical infrastructure has typically been viewed through the lens uh, of counterterrorism, um, uh, i.e., those things 
uh, throughout our communities that might be vulnerable or susceptible to some sort of terrorism activity or, or intervention. Uh, but as we've, as we've realised uh, over the decades that critical infrastructure is so much more than that, it certainly includes that. Uh, and as we look through the bushfires, uh, we know that critical infrastructure at the core of it is really about those things that we as individuals, we as communities, uh, rely on, depend upon to be able to operate and function, i.e. power, water, sewer, uh, data, telecommunications. Uh, and, and it's interesting, um, um, the feedback from the fires, the feedback from the disasters is that people are increasingly uh, looking for and wanting the reliability of that infrastructure to stay up to date with public information and warnings, to stay up to, stay up to date and connect with family and loved ones. But also we saw uh, down the south coast uh, so many of those misleading stories uh, where, where the reports were that fuel stations were running out of fuel when we want to do uh, evacuate <clears throat> lots of people from the south coast. It wasn't true at all. It wasn't a matter of running out of fuel in the fuel stations. Uh, the reality was that the power was out to so many of those areas. There was plenty of fuel in the ground, but they couldn't pump the fuel bales to get the fuel out of the ground. And when they did finally put generators in some of the key fuel stations to get the fuel up out of the ground, no one could bloody pay for anything because all we do is tap and go these days and there was no and there was no data. There was no data services and even people that knew they had money in the bank couldn't go down to the main street to the to the hole in the wall because the power was out there as well. So so just in a in a microcosm there, um, a focus on what does uh, critical infrastructure look like, what are the metrics, what are the what are the baseline um, requirements around sustainable, resilient infrastructure design, operation and management, and how do we make sure we're getting the, we're getting the uh, connections right um, uh, to pull that together? In more recent times, we've seen the announcement from the Commonwealth uh, of what's called the National Recovery and Resilience Australia. Uh, it was going to be called um, uh, Resilience Australia, but they thought that was too cute, uh, given that we were already having Resilience New South Wales. So they've called it Recovery uh, and Resilience Australia. And the focus there is, and I've met with uh, colleagues uh, there as well already, uh, and there's going to be a big focus uh, on, on joined up, uh, more cohesive and coordinated efforts uh, everywhere from prevention and preparedness and mitigation uh, right through to the response and recovery elements around strategies, programs, priorities, uh, and of course, funding. Yes, they changed their name slightly, but you wouldn't believe it. Uh, the fellow that's heading up uh, uh, the national body, his name is Shane Stone. So uh, we've, got, we've got Shane from Resilience at the Commonwealth, Shane from Resilience at the state level. Uh, and I said uh, very clearly, what could possibly go wrong with that level of confusion? But the reality is, uh, if anything's being attributed to Resilience uh, and Shane, and it's a positive thing, we'll take credit for it. Uh, anything... <laughs> Anything that is not going too well, uh, I'm going to suggest it's probably a Commonwealth matter and they hint them in that direction. So, um, <clears throat> but we've had, that, we've had that banter and I've got to tell you, as, as true as I stand here, uh, only a couple of weeks ago, my colleague Shane from the Commonwealth was visiting some of the flood areas in the Hawkesbury and they were having some community meetings and talking about things. And um, uh, that afternoon, we were getting emails into my office saying, what the bloody hell is Shane talking about this for? I thought we've had this conversation with him, et cetera. And so my team's saying, have you been out of the Hawkesbury this morning? I go, no, I haven't. I've been in here all day. So we worked out it was, it was the feds out there visiting. So uh, it is a real issue, and, um, um, but, but we've got this extraordinary commitment to join up and work very closely together. As a new agency, we spent, we spent a deal of time um, working out what we would be and how we would function. Uh, and I was able to secure a budget at the end of last year to lock in uh, the new organisation, the new structure with a new remit uh, from prevention through to recovery, uh, building confidence, giving confidence to communities across New South Wales to live, work and invest. We will do that through leading and coordinating disaster management and recovery, driving strategies and investments uh, to reduce risk, build resilience of communities to significant stresses, shocks and disasters of all kinds. We've been very fortunate to, to secure a dedicated ongoing staffing cohort. Uh, when I got there, 25 to 30% of our personnel only uh, were ongoing employees of the organisation. Everybody else that we had uh, was under some temporary ad hoc um, engagement arrangement. So being able to secure that uh, has been wonderful. Um, we've, we've, we've announced uh, our five uh, executive directors uh, into, the, into the different portfolios. 
uh, and recruitment is currently underway uh, with interviewing and, and progressing our band one executives. And in this last week, uh, I've advertised the first block of what will be about 130 jobs um, um, to fill in all our graded staff across the organisation. We're in the process of ratifying half a dozen regional locations to ensure that we've got a focus and a presence uh, across, across the state. Um, I learnt when I arrived there that we haven't had that historically uh, and certainly didn't have it when I arrived there. <clears throat> Our five directorates centre around strategy, policy and programs. A second body of uh, second directorate is around <clears throat> local coordination and service delivery, which is that real close link with local government, um, uh, local business, community organisations, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, operations management and partnerships uh, at the state and national level, uh, our finance and investment um, uh, tied in with strategy and need at the local level, and then as you would expect, an area around people performance uh, and governance. I'm really pleased to see the level of interest uh, in, in this space, in fire and emergency services, in resilience. Um, it's encouraging to see. When I advertised the five executive directors, we had about 830 applications. And with the band one executives that we've advertised, we've had just over 1,900 applications. Um, um, and I'm glad I'm using a recruiting firm uh, and not having to do that ourselves. But it is a strong signal that people are passionate and interested and ready to work <clears throat> in disaster preparedness um, um, uh, and recovery. Over the last 12 months or so, um, I've visited as many areas as I could and transitioning from, from the RFS uh, through to resilience. It was, it was one, of the, one of the key um, um, drivers for that decision centred around the ability to stay connected and to be a part of something uh, that went to providing support and assistance to those impacted and affected uh, and to stay in connection with and in a relationship with an organisation and an industry and a sector uh, that I'd spent uh, so many decades being a part of. But when I took on the role, <clears throat> and as I've said publicly, originally it was just going to be an organisation called Disaster and, and Recovery and Emergency Management or something like that, as a simple firefighter, it related, I related to that. But then when it got close to the announcement, they decided to call it resilience. I remember having a conversation with the Premier and the Minister and the Head of the Public Service. And I said, what the bloody hell's resilience? No one's going to understand that word. It's not going to mean anything to anybody. <clears throat> but I've got to say, in the last 12 months, I don't know whether it's just my antenna being finely tuned. I'm sure it's not. But I just don't recall ever the word resilience being so used so often and so consistently uh, so casually and so formally, um, whether it's family and friendship circles, uh, whether it's in our workplaces or our, or our volunteer organisations, whether it's in our mainstream media or our political discussions, the word resilience is just coming up over and over and over again. And it caused me to do a lot of personal reflection on my own life experience, uh, but also uh, a fair bit of reading. Uh, but more importantly, as I travel around, um, listening and hearing what people are saying that they regard as resilience. And when you look it up in the definitions um, online or in dictionaries, yes, they still exist, those dictionaries. Um, um, but if you look up online and have a look, invariably you'll find narrative like um, an ability to bounce back to normal quickly after, after impact or an event, um, words to that effect. And I just don't cop it. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's right in the context that we're talking about. Firstly, um, invariably people don't bounce back. Uh, it's a really difficult and challenging uh, process to come back from something that's really affected you and disrupted you. Um, and secondly, uh, I don't know that you go back to normal because I don't know what normal is and why would we be encouraging anybody to go back to where they were when they were so profoundly impacted and affected by something? Surely you've got to be wiser and smarter. So for me, <clears throat> what, I, what I believe is at the core of resilience uh, is the fact that resilience is built through lived experiences. And whether, we're, whether that's at the individual level, the family level, the business level, the community level, organisational level, it's about those lived experiences where we're impacted and affected, where we're displaced, where things go wrong, and we find ourselves wondering, how on earth am I going to get back through this? How am I going to recover from this? How am I going to come back stronger? 
the reality is if we think about it on lived experiences and life experiences, I read a great article uh, from the US um, Psych Association that described resilience like being a canoeist going down a river. And as a canoeist in the river, you're all geared up, you're ready to go, you've got your paddles, you've got your little canoe, and away you go. And for most of the river, you're going to find these beautiful, tranquil, reflective waters. The serenity is lovely, waters are calm, and you're just going along swimmingly. But every now and then, you'll come across some turbulent water. You'll come across some turbulent water uh, that might knock you around a bit, that causes you to, causes you to develop new skills, causes you to be able to adapt and adjust. But when you come out of the other side, side of that turbulent water, you'll find clear waters again, you'll find calm waters again. But it's a time to regroup, it's a time to reflect, it's a time to learn what you've learned. Sometimes those turbulent waters might even damage your canoe, might even bust your canoe up. So you realise that the canoe you had wasn't resilient enough, so the next one you get, or the repairs you make, will ensure that it's stronger and more robust and able to deal with, with the next rapids that you, might, that you might wander through. So for me, <clears throat> resilience is absolutely about lived experience. It goes to the heart of learning. It goes to the heart of growing and adapting and coming out the other side better, wiser, stronger. It's about stoicism. It's about strength. But I've also had some really difficult conversations over the last 12 months or so that I've really been challenged in processing. And it doesn't matter whether it's around a kitchen table in someone's home, whether it's at the local pub, a local community group, or indeed uh, a conversation on the telephone. And, and I cannot tell you how many times I've had conversations with people that say, Shane, can you make sure someone has a conversation with my husband? Can you make sure someone has a conversation with mum and dad? Can you make sure someone has a has a, has a chat to dad or a chat to grandpa? He's, he's, he's wandering around the property. He's, he's got this business to repair. He's, he, he thinks he's going to do it all. He reckons there's people worse off than him, so he's not putting his hand up for help. There's no bloody way I'll be able to get to him and get him to go and get some counselling. God forbid he won't, he won't go anywhere near that. But then there was also a really confronting call that I had uh, with a former RFS colleague. Um, Lisa and I were, were visiting some of the disaster-impacted areas uh, over the Christmas New Year break, uh, and particularly um, um, the anniversary markers uh, for the loss of Sam and Colin and so many people down the southeastern quadrant of, of New South Wales. And I remember one night uh, on the way home uh, having a conversation with a, with a mate from the RFS. It was an emotional conversation. There was tears at both ends of the phone and we were reflecting on how, how it had been 12 months. And I said to him, are you getting some help? Are you, are you accessing the service? He says, yeah, yeah, I am. He said, it's really, it's really working well. And I said, what's it doing for you? And he said, well, I didn't realise how much I was shutting out my wife. He said, I didn't realise how much uh, I, was, I was being too hard on the kids. And he said, and I probably wasn't doing my best back at work. And I said, but are the, I said, are the services helping? He said, yeah, they are. He said, I'm, 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 really, I'm really turning a page and I'm, I'm, I'm not shutting people out and I'm, I'm opening up a little bit more uh, and I'm going okay at work. I said, that's great, mate. You're going to keep going. He said, yes, I am. I said, no, I'm really proud of you. Keep going and we'll stay in touch. And he said, yeah, no worries at all. He said, but before you go, he said, can you promise me something? I said, yeah, what's that? He said, you've got to promise me that you won't tell anyone. I said, I, said, I won't tell anyone what? And he said, I don't want you to tell anyone that I'm getting help. I said, you've got to be flipping kidding me. <laughs> and um, I didn't use the word flipping, obviously. Um, but... I said to him, I said, you've got to be kidding. I said, after everything, what's your problem? He said, mate, I don't want people to judge me. He said, I don't want anyone to judge me. I don't want anyone to think that I'm not coping. I don't want anyone to think that I'm not up to it. And he said, and I certainly don't want anyone to think that I'm not up to coming back to work and connecting with my, my team and the, and the volunteers. And I said, well, I think you're a bloody idiot. And he said, well, he said it's just the way it is. He said, I'm asking you to, 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 be, to be true and not share that. And I said, look, I will share it. I said, as much as you give me the irrits, and I didn't say irrits, I said, I, said, I, said, I, I, will, I will keep true to that. So I have, I have shared this story a number of times, and I've kept him anonymous. And I left that phone call quite troubled. And I thought to myself, after everything that we had just been through during that 1920 fire season, after everything we'd focused on 
in the decades in my role uh, and my various roles in this organisation. I thought we'd destigmatised enormously this male macho bullshit culture that talks about the inability to be human when we go through very difficult and traumatic events. Resilience is about lived experiences. It is about living through difficult, distressful, traumatic times. But we're kidding ourselves if we don't reflect on those lived experiences and think that there isn't a significant emotional, psychological trauma that's occasioned from time to time. Anyone that thinks we get through those difficult events without having an impact on our thoughts, feelings and emotions is deluded. So my plea is to everybody, and yes, I'm singling out men in particular, but it's not a male domain. But in my experience, us men are the worst offenders. But we've all got to do our bit, men and women alike. And my plea is, look at the person in the mirror and give yourself permission to recognise the fact that you're a human, that you've got thoughts, feelings and emotions. And from time to time, you're going to be traumatised. You're going to have a tough day. You're going to reflect with sadness and sorrow on what happened, on what's been lost, on the challenges that confront us and that are before us and where to go. But they're also offset by extraordinary optimism and hope because you're not alone. And if you can give yourself permission to acknowledge that and give yourself permission to go and talk to others and ask, are they okay? How are they going? But most importantly, pause, listen, and for goodness sake, hear the response and back it up. Hear the response, let them know that it's okay. Let them know, importantly, that there are supports and assistance available out there to help you through those, uh, through those challenging times. Some people like and benefit from the peer review. Others prefer the benefit of anonymity and referred services. Some of us rely on, on a combination of both. But our ability to get through challenging times and those challenging times just don't disappear a few days later or a few months later, is when we can actually individually and collectively come together and recognise that there is no stigma, there is no shame, it is normal to be human, and it is normal uh, when it comes to resilience to grow and adapt and be stronger, but acknowledging that there's an emotional toll and that together we actually can get through it. I think there's lots of learnings that you pick up, and I always go to kids for some of the greatest learnings and as I visited a number of schools and a number of, number of venues around the state where kids' projects have been put up, when you spend time talking with them and their counsellors and their year advisors and their mums and dads and nans and pops, there's a couple of phrases that often come through. Number one, when kids start talking, they realise, I am not alone. Then they end up coming up with another phrase when they talk to each other, they realise that you are not alone. So they say, oh, I'm not alone, you're not alone, and then they work out that we are not alone. So my message to you all is... You are not alone. We are not alone. Continue to go strong and grow, but do so in the knowledge that you are human beings with thoughts, feelings and emotions. And it's OK and, dare I say it, necessary to ensure that you personally, where appropriate, and also make, make, make um, uh, suggestions to others that they access and utilise the extraordinary services that are available across the organisation to help you through what are very difficult and challenging times.